into thinking, conversation, questions, things of that sort. So I will not be over, overly uh, involved in actually giving the presentation. Self-organizing teams are something that are talked about a lot in Agile. They are supposed to be one of the Agile virtues, the ability of having a self-organizing team. Uh, something magical is supposed to happen about that. The concept is, is relatively simple. You get a whole bunch of people in the room, you give them some autonomy, uh, they organize themselves, don't require management and, uh, and close direction and things of this sort, and they just magically somehow or other coalesce into this high performance, high functioning organization or entity that is able to produce software. A lot of misconceptions about that whole notion and it's not very well grounded in any kind of understanding discipline science anything of that sort so we're going to start off today trying to explore a look at those foundations to begin with so we see things that we call self-organization and which we have used as metaphors for what we want to have happen in our organizations, in our software development teams. We can see it in chemistry. We can see that if you add two solutions together, they will spontaneously crystallize into a, a, a very defined, very rigorous structure. Uh, that's a kind of self-organization of the atomic, of the atoms and the molecules. We see it a lot in biology, and biology is the ultimate source of how we have been thinking about uh, self-organization. Uh, the cell, from the, the basis of a cell up to the basis of an organism, these are all examples of self-organization. We see it in complex adaptive systems, which is another part of what is talked about in Agile, that we can have self-organization because we are a complex adaptive system, and we sell, see complex adaptive systems from uh, all the way up to societies and cultures as these kinds of self-organized phenomena and emergent phenomena. They aren't something that you can direct, something that you can control. It just magically happens when you put all of the right ingredients together. Same kind of thing, uh, agent-based systems are really kind of a corollary or a subsidiary of the overall uh, notion of complex adaptive systems. But this would be birds, things of that sort. So the common thread from all of these things is that we say self-organization is a way of getting some kind of order out of chaos. That you put a bunch of things together and they just magically coalesce into something that is meaningful and useful. As I mentioned, we're talking about self-organization in kind of the agent-based, biological, uh, social insect kind of uh, concept. So when we think self-organization, these are the kinds of things that we are most likely to think about and therefore are most likely to be the sources of the metaphor that we hope to apply inside of Agile. We have things like termite mounds uh, that are uh, very complex structures. They have a very complex architecture as seen in that lower left uh, photograph. Uh, the real termite mound with the uh, prowling predator uh, in the picture above it, fish schooling, traffic jams uh, are a way of, they are a kind of self-organization. Uh, you go out on the streets of India, you have really what is an agent-based self-organized system. Their uh, agent-based systems work by you give autonomous entities very simple rules uh, that they obey and they by each individual obeying that same set of rules, they give this manifestation of order, uh, um, or organization, at least. Uh, the only rule in Indian traffic is don't run into the person in front of you. <laughs> this kind of order was talked about in biology a long time ago. Um, uh, one of the people who has popularized it and brought it into the realm of the software world was Umberto Maturana working with Francisco Varela. 
and they wrote a book called The Tree of Knowledge. They later worked extensively with Terry Winograd at Stanford and developed or tried to use and apply these theories to uh, design in software, uh, the, the design of software, and tried to figure out how design of something could come from these kinds of self-organizing principles. Autopoiesis is the really cool name given to this idea or principle of self-organization. It's very simple to describe. You have entities, the little circles are individual entities that may or may not be uh, substantial. So it could be a protein in a cell, for instance. Uh, but these semi-inanimate, semi-animate entities start to establish relationships with each other. And these relationships are really basically stimulus and response. That I emit this kind of stimulus and somebody else receives it and responds to me. If that stimulus response cycle gets reinforced, then we are said to be structurally coupled. And we can, uh, that would be the horizontal arrows between the two circles. That's an example of structural coupling. Uh, there is also a second aspect of that structural coupling, and that is to the in total environment, or the total context in which you exist. So there's this idea or notion that the context and the organism that self-organizes in that context are inextricably linked and are in fact one and the same thing uh, at, a, at a very fundamental kind of level. should also note that the horizontal structural coupling from the point of view of either one of the circles, the other circle is just part of the context. It's not like two little things inside of uh, a common context uh, dealing with each other. You can take this uh, simple context and you can move it up to the point that you have what uh, Varela and Maturana call third order structural coupling, where you can have structural coupling between these entities in the context but you can also have it within entities within the entity. So the idea or the growth of a nervous system would be an example of this kind of uh, structural coupling. And we self-organize so that we can get really complex organisms like yourselves uh, that have a nervous system, have all kinds of structural coupling with other aspects and elements of yourself. Uh, then these complex entities still can participate in the same kind of structural coupling with their context and with other entities which are part of that context. But autopoietic systems organize only to establish and maintain themselves. Uh, a cell has no clue what it's doing or what it's contributing to the rest of the body and doesn't care. Uh, your liver doesn't really much care about the rest of your body, it just is. Uh, and it organizes and maintains itself. And that is not sufficient, so we can look to some other ideas that might give us a better hint or a better clue about the kind of self-organization that uh, we are actually seeking or that we think that we are seeing in our Agile teams. So these are seven principles about large-scale, well, small to large-scale systems. Uh, they are supposed to if these seven principles are present in a system, it has the capability of organizing itself uh, to itself. And they apply from cells all the way up to civilizations or cultures, a very large-scale macro phenomenon. Uh, you need population variation. Uh, you have to have a variety of things in your environment. You need to have uh, some kind of persistence that when a new combination or a new structural coupling comes into place, it has to be able to survive more than a nanosecond. You can't have structural couplings uh, between atomic elements above a certain number because they don't live long enough, uh, don't persist long enough. So you have to have some way of maintaining yourself at least for a while to uh, participate in the later phase, which is the competition phase. Uh, you need to have reinforcement that structural coupling is a statistical phenomenon. So if the mutation occurs in a biological organization, 
that mutation has to have some stability, it has to be able to last for a while, but it also has to have company, it has to have companions, it has to have that mutation replicated in other parts of the organism so that you get this kind of reinforcement so that you can really see what the consequence or effect of that change is going to be. Then you have the competition. This is the evolutionary mechanism that we compete for market share, so to speak, inside of the biological environment in which we exist and the weak die out. Uh, we need uh, cooperation. So this notion of some kind of symbiosis uh, and also the, very importantly, this notion of coevolution. So I have said several times that the structurally coupled entities and their context have to mirror each other. They, have, they, are, they are in fact mirrors of each other. You have to have a coevolution. Uh, human beings are the absolute best ultimate example of that that we adapted to a natural environment in which we existed, then we busily proceeded to change that natural environment, um, and then we would co-evolve with it. So as we changed our environment, eradicated diseases, things of this sort, we became bigger and longer lived and uh, all kinds of other things. But then you can get to a tipping point where you end up destroying the very context which makes you um, uh, sustainable. So this idea or notion of coevolution is very important. Then you need combinatorial richness. You need to be able to mix this diverse population together in different ways. Uh, you have to have um, a fairly high mutation rate, so to speak, uh, ability to recombine and, and restructure yourselves in different ways. And then you have to cycle through this over time so that it is very much an evolutionary kind of a process. So these seven principles, they do describe very well self-organizing systems at almost any level of scale. Unfortunately, yes? Can't. So the question was, is how do we uh, see competition within self-organizing teams? And the short answer now is can't, but I'll come back to that in just a second. So even with these seven principles and when we're looking at things as large scale as a culture or a, quote, self-organizing team in an agile process or an agile environment, they still are focused on the self, on the organism itself. There is no sense of purpose that we have not organized for anything beyond maintaining ourselves, establishing and maintaining ourselves. So self-organization gets you that far, even if it is at a very large scale. So a culture exists to preserve itself. It doesn't exist to make you a happy human being, it exists to preserve itself. What we really want is not self-organizing systems, so to speak, uh, or we want a variation on self-organizing systems, which are called allopoetic systems instead of autopoetic systems. An example of an allopoetic system is something that is organized to produce something else. Factory is the exemplar. Uh, people put together factories, they assemble all of that heavy equipment. Uh, when we are building software, we're busily taking all these little modules and putting them together in order to produce something else other than just the modules themselves. So an allopoetic system has a purpose. It does things of interest and of value. And they're easy to get. Really good thing. Uh, you can take any random combination of the people in this room, put them together, they will self-organize and they will produce software. Unfortunately, they will produce, they will organize themselves and produce software of the, that reflects themselves in accordance with their context. So they're going to self-organize any, any time, don't care if you're officially doing Agile or not, you put a team together and tell them to self-organize and do productive work, they're going to self-organize and do the exact same kind of productive work that they always have. Because you haven't changed the whole context. And in point of fact, it, it really doesn't matter whether you change the whole context or not. 
you can see this in the macro uh, in Agile very easily. The concepts, the principles, the practices that were introduced 13 years ago have been diluted and co-opted and are a pale shadow or imitation of themselves. And this is an example of that kind of self-organization in work. A user story looks really weird and strange and this makes us very uncomfortable. So we co-evolve. We adapt the user story until it's something that is nothing more than something we already are familiar with and know a requirement. So we busily adapt and co-evolve. And in the macro level, it's, it's very obvious to see in the Agile community. So it would only be possible to have a self-organizing allopoetic system if you were, in fact, changing everything. Some of the things that Agile does affect these horizontal structural couplings. Some of the Agile practices actually do try to establish different kinds of relationships between the entities that are in that environment. But it does nothing about changing the overall, overall context of the environment. And the very first time you saw a book called Agile Project Management is an example of a failure to change, to do, uh, do what you were expected to do in terms of self-organization. You're just reimposing the old structure uh, onto things. But changing everything will still not give you what you want. You can have a really complex self-organizing structure, an allopoetic structure, uh, like a beehive. A beehive, from one perspective, is not just about producing more bees and more beehives. So it's a little bit beyond producing itself. It produces honey. You open a beehive and you see honey. And so you immediately jump to the conclusion that, ah, bees exist to produce honey. They're a little honey factory and totally you know, ignore the fact that bees produce honey for their own consumption. The fact that you like honey, bee couldn't care less. And it has, plays absolutely no role whatsoever in whether or not that system takes on the form or the structure that it does. So I have been wrestling with this uh, presentation because of where this conclusion leads us that self-organizing systems for purpose, for creating better software, et cetera, are flat out impossible. Can't get there. You cannot have a self-organizing system uh, that will do what you are expecting when you blithely use the term self-organizing team. It's an oxymoron. But maybe that's not what you really want. Maybe what you really want is a team that has an enhanced ability to produce high quality working software efficiently. And by efficiently, I mean the proper cost uh, ratio uh, kind of notion. That's what we really want. And we say, ah, self-organization is going to give us that. Well, it's not. You can't get that from self-organization. The best that you can hope to is to rebalance, reestablish, reinforce different kinds of relationships, particularly the power and responsibility relationships that exist among a group of people. Uh, the power relationship, the autocratic, all-powerful manager, the poor defenseless little team, agile helps you restructure or rebalance that power relationship, or it's supposed to. Uh, the customer and the development team, who are bitter enemies and have been for decades. They didn't start off that way, by the way, but they have been bitter enemies for decades, neither side trusting the other. The user story and the product backlog are supposed to be a rebalancing of that power relationship. And you have to then you know, take those kinds of ideas seriously if, in fact, you want to rebalance that relationship. If you deny access to the customer, deny developers access to the customer, you are not rebalancing the relationship. If you have a product owner or some other kind of intermediary uh, in between, 
you're just reinforcing the old relationship that used to exist. It's still an us versus them kind of a notion that you have to change that relationship in some real ways. Self-responsibility, accountability, and transparency are the other things that make it possible to be a high productive team is that you have to take a lot more responsibility, you have to accept a lot more accountability, and the other side does as well. Uh, you have to rebalance and restructure that relationship. And then transparency is one of the biggest ones of all. So we have heard, uh, I've heard a couple of presentations here today talking about in fact, uh, Craig Larman's keynote that this absence of transparency, so the little exercise of people reporting up the chain of command and obfuscating things along the way, that's not very transparent. So transparency is absolutely essential if you want the outcome that you want. It doesn't come from self-organization, it comes from courage. One of the four XP principles that have pretty much diffused throughout all of Agile. So if you want what you think you want from a self-organized team, you're only going to find it and get it by exploring this idea of courage and how you enhance courage. So uh, Kung Fu Tzu, uh, popularly known as Confucius, talked about names. You're going to have disorder under heaven until everything gets their proper name. So what I am suggesting to you is follow Confucius' advice and drop self-organization from your vocabulary. Uh, Bodhidharma said, you know, this pursuit of this particular thing, like understanding self-organization, tends not to edification. It's not going to get you anywhere. It's a pointless term to have in your vocabulary. What you should do in instead is look at what are the roots of courage? How do we increase and maximize the courage of the people in the team? number of different kinds of things, and they're all existing agile practices or agile principles in some form or another. Uh, transparency, make things visible. The notion of big visible charts uh, was not just for um, you know, counting progress or measuring progress or giving quantitative uh, information about how, to, how the team is doing or what they are doing at any point in time, it's existing to make the tacit implicit. One of the really critically pieces of tacit information, really critical pieces of tacit information that exists in the team is individual contribution to the team effort. Uh, I teach, I have been a professor for a long time, uh, now transitioning out of that but I assign team projects. And guess what? You give a bunch of students a team project and one or two people in the team do all the work and the rest just kind of sit there and watch what's going on. Will anyone come and tell the teacher? No. Does everybody in the team know that information? Do they, could they tell you probably to a decimal point who's contributing what percent of the effort to that team thing? Of course they know. One of the things that the anthropologists have studied and have been aware of are forms of reciprocity. And there's this form uh, called balanced reciprocity. It's where everybody contributes in a balanced fashion or that the exchange is fair. Both sides arrange for a, an exchange that is, that is equally fair. So you get a group of friends that go out to dinner or drinks every Friday night and uh, you know, different people pay at different times or you split the paycheck at different times. Uh, over a long period of time, six months, a year, you could sit down and you could interview each member of that team and they could probably tell you with accuracy less than a dollar who was out of balance in that team. So yes, so and so. They, they paid their share kind of, but they're about $3.77 in arrears in terms of what everybody else has contributed. We know this stuff. Big visible charts make it uh, overt and explicit 
in a way that it can't be denied, can't be hidden, and where it can have action taken upon it. The uh, Baldridge quality method. Uh, this is one of the critical principles of that, is this kind of transparency. So if you want to see what, if you want to improve performance, make the performance public. Uh, you're not violating any confidentialities. Everybody knows it anyway. You're just making it overt where it can't be ignored. Uh, when you do your estimates, do honest estimates. Uh, we have a number of different practices that are supposed to get you to some kind of consensus estimate about how difficult or how hard a particular user story is going to be to implement. And the games are designed to force consensus, not accuracy. Uh, the only way that you can get accuracy is by paying attention to the person who has the most experience with that specific kind of um, activity or uh, result that you're seeking uh, that's implicit in that story. So you need to be able to give honest estimates and you can't do fudge factors. Uh, this is all uh, in, in standard agile practices you're not su supposed to use fudge factors. You're supposed to be real numbers so that you can compute ultimately a real team velocity. Same thing when you're doing a budget for your team. It has to be honest and as accurate as you can make it not in any way uh, fudged or made ex uh, explicit. Uh, the idea of mood walls and retrospectives. These kinds of things need to be taken into conjunction. You need, again, as part of making the implicit, the tacit, explicit and overt. You need to have everybody aware that yes, nobody's happy. Uh, that's a kind of a courage and these are tools or techniques for doing it. When you're doing your retrospectives, can't tell you how many times uh, there, there's, there's lots of kudos to go around. Uh, there's very seldom much in the way of self-criticism when it comes to things that we should do differently or do less of. Uh, not much thought given to experiments. And I'm saying this with great trepidation because we have the retrospective guru in the room uh, and she can probably contradict everything I just said, but uh, this is my experience. Collective responsibility, the idea or notion that the team is a team, there is no I in team, is a good thing up to a point. Uh, the team cannot afford, if it's going to be as good as it can be, it really cannot afford uh, to have free riders in the team. And it can't have people in the team who are resisting the collective efforts of the rest of the team. Uh, so there, it requires courage to confront a fellow team member and say, you're just not cut out for Agile, would you please transfer to another team? But that kind of thing is necessary. And again, it needs to be public and overt. Uh, you need to be able to point at the wall and say, look, doesn't matter who you pair with, that pair's performance is lower than every other pair in the room, it's got to be your problem. Please do something about it, change yourself, improve yourself, or leave. Uh, so collective responsibility has its, its limits and constraints. Uh, for the first N iterations, uh, the, the stand-up meeting and its formulaic, what, what did you do, what are you doing, what issues or problems do you have, really badly abused. Um, I was at one company, we did, I was coaching, trying to train them in Agile, and I was coaching four different teams and they were all having stand-up meetings. First of all, they didn't have them in front of the storyboard, they had them around a phone because one of the team members was in Colorado. Uh, and the rest of the team was in Indianapolis. Uh, so they uh, have, have their, their little meetings and they go through their ritual three things. But the, the gist of it was, well, yesterday I met with so-and-so, today I'm going to meet with so-and-so, and I have no issues. That was the whole thing, the whole stand-up, and every single person reported the same thing. The fact that they were having these meetings constantly meant that there probably were some issues. And if you are just starting out as an Agile team, and nobody on the team is reporting any issues, somebody's being really dishonest. 
So for the first n iterations, I would mandate that you know even if it makes the meeting go 15 minutes instead of five minutes. If you can't come up with an issue, you can't leave the meeting. Uh, because they're there, you're just not being honest about them. And then the last thing up there is just say no. And you can't delegate this responsibility strictly and solely to the coach. I know that coaches exist to be an interface between you and the big, bad, ugly world of management. And they're the ones that are ultimately supposed to say no to the managers. Uh, or yes to the managers, i.e. give me this resource because the team needs it. But it's not just the coach's responsibility. You all have to have the ability to say no at different times. This should, could be generalized also to just say no to doing the wrong thing. Um, or that we should not as a team be doing this. So I took you in a direction that came to a conclusion that you can't get there with the vocabulary or what you're talking about, uh, that probably, well, I hope it was really provocative, that you're now sitting there really annoyed, full of feedback. So I'm open for questions, comments, discussion, and anything except you can't throw things at me. So, yes. 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 <laughs> you. comment was that he disagrees, which is really cool. Uh, that in his conversations with coaches and in his experience, he has seen self-organization. So he will admit that it is difficult, uh, but achievable. And in fact, most coaches would claim that it's achievable. And then the implicit or the explicit question in that from that comment was, have I done my research? And the answer is yes. But the research has taken on a little bit of a, a slightly different kind of a form, is that I actually want, went and looked at these teams that were reported to be self-organized teams. And from an outsider's perspective, so I'm not a team member, I'm an outsider's perspective. So I am trying to figure out, you know, or trying to see what it is that they're doing. They're reporting, yes, we had this kind of self-organized success. But what people tell you and what you can see are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, an example, cultural example, totally outside of, of this domain. Uh, the... Uh, Damn, now I just blanked on the name of the culture. Uh, is, anyhow, it's a Brazilian uh, primitive culture. Uh, the Yanomami are considered to be the mo were considered at one time to be the most violent people on the planet. They were constantly at war with each other, constantly fighting a bunch of little small groups out in the Brazilian rainforest. And you ask them, why are you so violent? And they say, oh, well, it's because there's a shortage of women that we have to fight constantly in order to acquire women so that we can continue our existence. That if there were more women to go around, we would not be so violent. So the anthropologist sits and observes and says, oh gee, that's, uh, you know, that, that's a semi-plausible explanation. But why do you practice female infanticide? Why do you kill your little girls? Why do you allow the men in your tribe that are too old to have children to have multiple wives, including the most beautiful, fecund, uh, young 
women in the tribe. So when I look at these self-organizing teams, I see something much different, something much more. These are teams that have, in fact, figured out a way to have the kind of courage to do what they want to do. They have taken responsibility for doing what they want to do. They report that acceptance of responsibility and accountability as being self-organized. But it really has nothing to do with self-organization. Uh, so, I mean, the, the principle, the concept, the idea is, you know, it's irrelevant. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that you can't get gelled high-performance teams. You obviously can. But it doesn't come from self-organization. It comes from something else. And if you really want to understand how to replicate that phenomenon or how to ensure more teams achieve that kind of state, stop talking about self-organization and start talking about things like courage. Because that's where I believe you will find your answer. Yes? So again, I wouldn't say that self-organization is more aligned with different cultures, but it is very clear that different cultures have different, uh, different value systems which lead to very different forms of personal interactivity. Uh, a very, very simple example. Uh, pair programming, a practice, uh, it is supposed to be one of these things that contribute to self-organization. It really doesn't uh, contribute to communication. Uh, cultural differences in pair programming. There's a very famous published picture of an American male-female pair programming. The male is sitting vertical upright in front of the keyboard, and the woman is leaning way over like this. It's cultural differences of personal space. She is not comfortable sitting shoulder to shoulder uh, with the... Uh, with the guy. You look at two American males pair programming, there will be at least 12 inches between their shoulders. When I was uh, doing a training here in India, I saw my very first example of tri programming. So two males that are sitting shoulder to shoulder, uh, swapping the keyboard back and forth. The third one with his arms around both of them, <laughs> controlling the mouse. So that's a cultural difference in the way that the team interacts with each other. And, and yes, that very definitely exists. Yes? In the... Yeah, I'm interpreting your uh, thesis, so to speak. And second is a consequent question. Uh, what is that? Do you actually mean, or did I interpret right, that it's not self-organization is impossible? But it cannot be the instrument that it will lead you to your goal, or is there an impossibility of a, a, a goal first and then self-organization next? Or rather, it's, would courage just result in self-organization, as we call it? You can't aim for self-organization. Yeah, say it again in the microphone so that I don't have um, to try and recapitulate. <laughs> so the first is that um, my un what I gathered from the thesis is that um, Self-organization is not a possibility as a, uh, a cause and uh, you attempt it and that itself, uh, it, it can't be the goal and hence uh, you can't attempt it. Or is it that courage is the cause that or the instrument that will lead you to this end? And um, as a result of this, the um, actual real question is that, uh, as you just said, in a, a complex adaptive system, um, the system itself is kind of determined by the context. Mm -hmm. And would the context from which we gathered a lot of this uh, understanding be different or is it evolving in itself? For example, um, in evolutionary biology, uh, most of the earlier complex adaptive systems, the concept of intelligence was not, was, has been gradually evolving. And in a more intelligent context, is this more possible? So I heard two, two kinds of, of uh, questions in there. One is about uh, the possibility of having a, of a self-organization occurring that produced um, 
produce something of value, uh, something, something of interest. And the other one was about the mismatch between the context and the Agile teams. The second one is simpler, is that agility is very seldom practiced at the enterprise level. It's isolated within the uh, IT at best, or within a team within IT uh, more commonly. And so therefore, the team has no effect over the context in which it operates, has very little choice or control about how it's going to evolve into some kind of a structure. The other one, uh, the, the first question is that if uh, in an allopoetic system, uh, you can think of that as if I, if I put a random number of machine tools into a factory, how likely is it that they would spontaneously organize themselves into something capable of producing a car? Not very likely. It is very possible for a system or for, you know, for a set of entities uh, that share common values that are going to have established, be able to establish the right kinds of stimulus response, structural coupling with each other and with their environment, that they would uh, become like a honeybee hive. Only software instead of honey is their product. They will still be self-organized to produce honey for their own consumption. The fact that the enterprise then finds value in that honey was a total coincidence. You could probably get to the point of having a, a higher level macro evolution kind of thing that um, we have a whole bunch of random self-organizing teams that produce really good software, really good honey. And then introduce competition at that level among these teams such that the teams that are able to produce the sweetest honey are the only ones that get to replicate themselves. And all the other teams join the unemployment lines. You might get there that way. But I doubt that management's going to allow it. Yes, woman in the back. Just wait for the microphone, please. <laughs> it's coming. The self-organizing teams are, or self-organizing organisms, I suppose, are changing. They're adapting and mutating. Yeah. Then courage seems to be one of the things that changes the structure, the relationship with the environment. It's something you put into the change. But things like you can't uh, affect your company's hierarchy. Perhaps you can. And self-organization is a way of injecting and kind of adding courage into the team and into the whole organization, so into the management structure, to expect that if I've got a problem and the company's policies are affecting it, not allowing me to produce or do something at the right rate, that I can have that conversation with you. And if you are unable to change that policy, you can at least understand the impact on me so we can come to an agreement of another way to approach it. So, Everything is then mutated by adding courage, and you have then a different kind of organization that has become a different thing. Okay. Would that work as an alternative to self-organization doesn't work, okay. or you can't have it? So if you have a team that, is, that does have courage, that can say no, that can structure their interactions with their environment and their context in an appropriate fashion. You will probably also be part of a team that has a lot of information and data at its disposal so that it's better able to make the right choices, the right decisions. So that when they say no, they say no to the right thing. When they say yes, they say yes to the right thing. If you wish to call a team that has courage and has knowledge a self-organized team, I can't prevent you from doing so, but I would say that you are violating the understanding. Self-organization is a metaphor that was borrowed from other disciplines and applied to our own discipline. And in doing so, we either have to corrupt 
the meaning or abandon the metaphor. And all I was suggesting today is abandon the metaphor and focus on the things that are really important, like how do we have better information, how do we have increased courage, and it, you know, if you want to call it self-organization, it's not going to hurt anything, but it, uh, it can mislead your uh, future research. When you go and look at, well, how do we get more of this? Then you're going back to the metaphor. You're saying, well, how does a biological system get more self-organization or more self-organized? And you see those principles that I enumerated, and none of them are going to help you. But if you say, well, I don't, I'm not looking for self-organization. I'm looking for information, knowledge, and courage, which is you know, the, other, the other four values, you know, the communication and feedback. You're going to find your answers to the high performance, well-gelled, well-organized, well-structured team there. You're not going to find it by exploring the concept of self-organization. You talked about uh, uh, bringing about structural changes to have a meaningful change. Uh, what are your thoughts on Kanban, which talks about an evolutionary approach to change without ch changing the structure? Okay. Please say it again. I didn't quite. You talked about uh, meaningful change can only happen if we bring about structural changes. What are your thoughts on Kanban, which talks about evolutionary change without changing the underlying structure? So I'm, I'm hearing, and I'm not sure that I'm hearing correctly, the relationship between individual change or discrete changes and structural changes and you know, the, the complementarity of those. Is that close to what, what you were saying? I'm talking about uh, uh, an evolutionary approach. I mean, how would you compare and contrast an evolutionary approach as suggested by Kanban to a Kaikaku approach like Scrum, which brings about a lot of structural changes? Okay. I will have to confess to being puzzled and invite you to talk to me about it afterwards because I'm not sure I can give you an articulate answer right now. Thank you. But, but let's, don't, don't leave the room without talking to me. Okay. Yes. The transparency is really good. No, the public is good. I uh, question its existence. If it exists? Yes. Ah. Depending on your culture, depending on, um, well, your background or your beliefs or your values. So, um, and I think it's also in the eye of the beholder. So, I'm sort of wondering if transparency exists. <laughs> okay. First part of the answer is that yes, it absolutely exists because the kinds of things that you were taught to do in the Agile community makes you a part of that culture. And so you are supposed to be coming to a collective understanding that this card in this place on the wall or this bar on this place on the wall okay. means the same thing. So at, at that level, yes, transparency exists. So if you want to learn something, mm -hmm. uh, you want to have an input from another another vision and how could you have an input from another vision if you're already in the same line of thought mm -hmm. so so enculturation is, is the question that so the the set of us in this room that put up these big visible charts to us they are absolute transparent to the novice that comes into that context and wasn't part of building them, 
they are not transparent. They are opaque, and they're going to take time to learn them and figure them out. I do not agree. <laughs> Uh, you can read them in another way, you can have another interpretation, you can have a very good background from another field and they can mean something else, uh, which could be a very good value for the existing... Uh... This is the second part of my answer, is that at an absolute epistemological level, no, there is no such thing as transparency because everything has to be interpreted. But for practical reasons it's transparent, for absolute epistemological reasons, no, there is no such thing as transparency, which is why I very frequently will make the distinction between representational things and evocative things. So those things up on the wall are transparent only because they evoke the same memory in each of us that participated in their construction. They do not contain some kind of a truth because if they, if they were, each of us would have to interpret them and, we'd, and it would be different. So you have to make sure that that is really happening. Yes. It's, it's triggering a memory. Yes. And so that's, again, that's another one of those avenues that I would explore, that if I wanted a team that had these characteristics that I am attributing to self-organization as a term, I would go and look at how do we how do we um, establish a common culture? How do we establish uh, the same stories and memories and culture, you know, that kind of cultural background, so that we have reason to believe that those things on the wall are transparent because they evoke the same, same kind of cons uh, comments. Time. I saw a T-sphysical from the back of the room, so thank you very much. <laughs>